Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Phoenix Phenomenon. I'm your host, ghost writer Roxanne mccarty kane Thank you for joining us for another episode where we delve into the transformative process of becoming an author and talking to the change makers who know this journey all too well. Today I'm joined by internationally renowned forensic anthropologist and criminologist, author and television Dr. Zanthane Miller. She has written two previous books called Mothers for Murder, which was released in 2014, and Cold Case Investigations, which was released in 2019. Today, we'll be talking a lot more about her latest that release, Reason to Doubt, um, which has just gone to market here in 2020. So I'd like to fill in a little bit more for those of you who don't already know Zanthi and everything that she does um, around the country and internationally. So Xanthi is a forensic practitioner who works with police forces across Australia, assisting with the identification of persons of interest in criminal cases, as well as providing advanced DNA technology that assists with the identification of long-term deceased victims and suspects. This is all stuff that I really get excited about, so I'm going your brain. But in addition to all of this, um, she has a, a, a a lot of academic work going along, going along as well as the that again. In addition to this, Sandy also works a lot in the academic realm and contributes to various true crime television series, as well as being a regular contributor to crime news stories for television, radio, and print media. So welcome, Xanthi. I don't know how you've managed to squeeze us into your hectic schedule. So thank you. So <laughs> Lovely to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so first things first, with all of that going on, I'd love to know how it is that you find time to, to write books. Um, well, um, yeah, that's a good question. Whenever I'm going to do one, last one, my husband said, I was like, I'm going to do another book. And he was like, and when are you planning to sleep? Yeah. Oh, sleep, who needs that? <laughs> so I just really enjoy it, actually. I enjoy the process. Um, and it is a lot of work you know, and you do get really embedded in it. But um, I am a bit of a workaholic, but I do that because I really enjoy it, you know. So um, to me, I'm really lucky in that I really enjoy my job and it's so varied. I never get bored and, and the books are just part of that journey for me of doing things that I enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there's probably many people, I, I know I was one of them, that was looking at forensic sciences and criminology when I was looking at what I wanted to study at university. And it's something that's always fascinated me. But I'd love to find out from yourself what it was that piqued your interest in the career and, and set you on that path. So when I was at university, I did my undergraduate degree in archaeological sciences. And I most enjoyed all of the courses that looked at human evolution or bones or identification, all of that kind of side, more so than the cultural kind of archeology span side or pots or any of that. And that's interesting, but it didn't really light my fire. But I was also aware that in my career, I wanted to do something that helped people now. So archeology span is interesting and I love watching the programs, especially ones about mummies and all of that stuff. I find it amazing. But I, I really wanted to do something that had a contemporary impact. And I'm not saying archaeology doesn't, but for me, it had to be about helping people, providing information that could actually assist them in some way. Mm. So when I did my master's, I looked at how the head and face adapts to environment. Um, so that was kind of more along the lines of identification. Um, and then for PhD, I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship to do a PhD in forensic facial recognition. So using CCTV and improving our methods of CCTV. And that was part funded by the FBI. So I got to go over to Quantico and give them our results from the study, which was amazing. I had all these FBI officers sitting around a table listening to me. And yeah, so I just got, I guess I was just lucky that I got a scholarship in, in forensics, which are incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. And from then, you know, I was just very passionate about continuing down that forensic human identification route. And I also became interested in looking at the um, behavioral side that goes along with that so that's why I kind of marry the forensics which is very much a physical science with the behavioral which is more of a social science. 
Absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. And so um, just for those of um, us who don't know much about what it is you would do on a day-to-day -day basis, is, is there such a thing as a typical day in the job of a forensic scientist? <laughs> Criminologist, <laughs> well, you know, there really isn't. It changes literally every single day. So, some days I'll be teaching. So, we've just finished the teaching for the first semester um, of this year, which was a really odd year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but I had 700 students that I was looking after in first semester. So, a lot of time given over to looking after them and making sure they all got through their courses. But then, you know, the books just come out. So, I've been doing a lot of interviews. There's always new crime stories breaking. Um, you know, there's, you know, stuff going on in WA at the moment that's fascinating. So I do a lot of TV and radio interviews about current forensic cases. And I'm also working with the police on a number of identification as well. So I was talking to a police officer this morning on my dog walk. So it literally, it's just so mixed. Um, yeah, it's just a, every day is different and uh, I never get, I never get bored. <laughs> so <laughs> that's always a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> Excellent. And we were talking off air about, um, obviously, we've got the three um, published books for, for the public, is the way that you describe it. Um, but you had started uh, venturing into academic texts beforehand. Um, I did want to ask you what it was that prompted you to, to take the step out with, with Mother to Murder and to, you know, create something for the general public. Yeah, well, I guess it was my students, really, because um, academic textbooks are obviously important. And growing up in that, you know, professionally growing up in a very academic environment, it's just something you do. You write academic textbooks, you edit textbooks, you do journal articles, and that's all very the normal path you kind of start to go down. And then as I was dealing more and more with students, I was realizing that, you know, academic textbooks are not really aimed at students. They buy them for their courses, but they're not buying them to learn stuff generally. You know, they're not engaging with the material in that way. And so when I started doing my research for PhD, I started looking at expert evidence and came across some of the cases. When I got here, I realized we had the same problems um, with women accused of murdering their children. But I knew that if I wanted to engage in a debate about that, then the academic literature is one way to do it. But if I wanted to talk to the students and wanted to get it as a broader discussion, I needed to go more for writing for a public audience. And actually, I love it, that freedom that you get with writing in your own voice that you don't get with academic literature. It's very stay, there's, you know, there's a particular procedure, a certain language you use, and it's all quite similar. You can't tell who's written different academic textbooks from the tone, from the voice. Whereas with writing for the public, you can, you have more freedom to use expressions, to be yourself, to have opinions and to really engage in some of those debates. So once I did one, I was kind of hooked actually after that and I still do journal articles but I haven't done another academic textbook because to be honest I really like writing these ones. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Well I think you've already answered my question there, like how, how easily you were able to adapt to this new style of writing. It sounds like you literally just found your voice and, and ran with it. I think I've worked with some great publishers and they really help develop your voice and give you the confidence and push you out of your comfort zone with the way that you're writing. And actually now I kind of find academic writing a bit frustrating because it is so constrictive. And uh, I use my, these books, the public books, I'm pointing here, these, obviously you guys can't see what I'm pointing at. I'm pointing at my book, which is unhelpful when you're on Zoom, isn't it? But I use these books in my teaching as well. So I can give them chapters that I've written to kind of broaden their horizons and, and talk about cases in a different way and teach them a different way of writing and communicating as well. So, yeah, I, I really enjoy this. I find it a much freer way of writing. Um, so I still have to do the academic kind because you just do as, you know, as a lecturer. But yeah, I kind of found, I think, what I really enjoy. Excellent. Oh, that's wonderful. And tell me about, um, I know you're, you're a third time author now, um, but tell me about the first time that you were able to, to hold a physical copy of, of your first book in your hand, what that moment was like for you. Well, I liken it to having a baby, but I've never had a baby, so I have no clue if it's like that at all. And obviously, it's not as physically painful, but it is, it is a really long process. And you, I guess you are giving life to something that you've thought about for a long time, that you've kind of worked on, that you've, you have babied and grown. And, and there's that moment of excitement when something goes from being a Word document 
to suddenly, you know, something solid arrives and you go, how did that happen from, you know, me typing away for, you know, months on end to actually this tangible thing. And the first time I saw my book in an airport, I was totally blown away. But you walk past the stand and your book's there and you're like, what is that doing there? You know, it's just this weird moment of something becoming solid and real. Um, and I, I never really got over that. Like when I first got this one, it's that scary kind of like, oh, I, I really did that. It's actually a real thing now. And it's almost alive. You know, it takes on a life of its own. People talk about it. People contact you about it, you know. And um, it's exciting, but it's, it's scary as well because these are real stories and they're real people and you've got to do them justice and you've got to be honest and you've got to have integrity because, you know, you're writing about people's lives. And so there's that excitement, but there's also that, that nervousness. So I want to know that everyone who's mentioned in here, the victims, you know, appreciate the way that their cases have been managed. Mm, mm, absolutely. And I think that that would probably be another element um, behind the, you know, motivating you to get these books out there is to, you know, to showcase you know, some of these things that the wider public, us readers don't know about the legal system and forensics and how sometimes things can slip through the cracks. And, um, yeah, it, it must be, must be so much um, excitement to be able to enlighten people that way. Yeah, it is. Um, and that's, I guess, that's why I've written each of them. The first one, as I said, was really came out of my PhD. Um, I looked at expert evidence and when it can go wrong, specifically in allegations of child death at the hands of mothers. Um, and then when I got here, the same thing was happening. And I was like, hmm, this is obviously not just a UK problem or a US problem. You know, we're the something about the culture and the way we view women in this sense is, you know, endemic and it's, it's systemic across various Western cultures. Um, the cold case book, I'd worked with a lot of victims and I knew the impact of not knowing what happened and why, you know, and that ongoing constant trauma that they go through. Um, so that came about through working with victims. And this one, I guess, just having worked in the criminal justice system now for quite a long time, I won't say how long, um, then I've seen so many problems that just seem to come up again and again and again. And, and I think having that public debate is really important, but I have to tread this really fine line because I do work with the police. Yeah. And I, in some ways, I'm criticizing some of the police procedure and some of the situations that have occurred, um, whilst also working with them on cases. But really, I see my role as working for the criminal justice system, rather than Ever the prosecution or defence. So if I see a problem, I think it's our role as objective practitioners to call that out so that we can deal with that. Because if we keep ignoring it, then it's not going to go away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so what is it, um, I guess, with all of the, the authorship and everything else you've got going on, when was it that you first linked in with, um, you know, helping with media stories and helping with um, consulting on television series and all that sort of stuff as well? That was totally an accident. So after my PhD, I was lucky enough to get a lectureship at the University of Dundee in Scotland. And that was at a forensic centre um, and for human identification. And my boss there, Professor Sue Black, had, we were always getting requests from different media companies to kind of showcase what we did. Um, but she loves doing radio and she hates doing television. So once I got there, I think she kind of saw it as an opportunity um, to do some television, but her not have to face it so much. Yeah. So I was kind of like the guinea pig without even really realizing it. And we were asked to do a couple of series for the BBC called History Cold Case. And although they were historical in focus, they were really about applying current up-to-date forensic techniques to archaeological remains to see what we could learn about them. And the whole point of that was educating the public on what forensic science could really do. Because this was at a time when CSI was massive. The CSI effect, we were seeing all these students come in to do the courses thinking they had to have no science because, you know, they just watch CSI and you just press the button. You just need to look hot in a lab coat and that's all the qualifications you need to be a forensic scientist. That's scary. And, <laughs> yeah, it was scary. We were looking at this going, these kids have no idea about what actually is behind this, not only their education in terms of science, but also the psychology of it. You know, some of the things they'll have to face. So really it was about, that was an educational project. So I did two series for BBC where I was kind of the 
the primary host, I guess, as it were. And then I did a series for Nat Geo. They picked up the same format. And it just kind of went from there. Um, people just kept asking me to do stuff. And, and I don't always do the projects. I always do the ones where I think there's a purpose. I never want to just do it because it's voyeuristic. So mm -hmm. if we're going to go into a cold case or review an investigation, I want there to be something we can add to it, somebody that can benefit from that. Um, so if a project comes up that I go, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, people keep asking me to do stuff and I go, yeah, okay, yeah. Excellent. And have you had, had, had any success with solving any cold cases that you've been involved in in, in any way um, over the years you've been working in there? So not just cold cases. When I first got to Australia, um, I did a series on Channel 10 in 2013 called Wanted, which was basically the equivalent of Australia's Most Wanted. Um, and we did 13 episodes of that. And of I think we covered about 16 or 18 cases across the episodes. And we had a, a significant number of cases that were progressed and solved as a result of that. But more than that, because the program was airing to somewhere between five and 700,000 people, what, the, what Crime Stoppers found was somebody wasn't necessarily caught because the Crime Stoppers number was always there. You know, these were current cases we were trying to progress. They found that people may not know anything about the abduction we just mentioned or the break and enter or the murder or whatever it was, but they did know that there was a drug dealer down the road. And so they'd call about that. So it was like this call to arms for lots of different cases. So the calls went up about 500%, I think, whilst the program aired and immediately afterwards. So there were a significant number of other cases that were solved and crimes that were reported because people got involved in the process. So that was really exciting to know that you were part of something that was genuinely helping the community. Absolutely. Excellent. I just got goosebumps. That's so incredible. And um, have you had any, any success or any outcomes from cases that you've um, highlighted in, in any of your books? Um, so, I mean, I did um, look at the Beaumont investigation in 2018. Um, we found what I think is probably the prime suspects. So I worked with Channel 7 on that, and I've included that in uh, the last book. I'm trying to remember which, which one that was in. That was in Cold Case Investigations. Cold case investigations yeah. yeah, I was like, which one was that in? Yeah, so um, we found what I think is genuinely the most likely person to have been involved in the abduction of the three Beaumont siblings in 1966. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't found them yet, but I haven't given up hope. And what was exciting about that investigation is I made contact with somebody who does geophysical um, searches. And so normally for archaeological remains. But since then, um, we've put some funding in together. I've got a new PhD student looking at these geophysical techniques for forensic purposes. So um, there's all sorts of things that kind of come together when you work on these cases. So that came out of a media project. I now have a really good kind of academic colleague that I'm working with and I've got a PhD student and that's going to feed into helping the police with searches going forward so it's kind of weird how these little pieces come together and you know make a whole that seems disparate a TV to you know PhD but actually they all feed into the same same thing yeah absolutely oh, awesome and I know from looking at you know the best sellers that we see in Australia and internationally you know True crime is pretty much always, always a hit. Um, you know, we, we love to sink our teeth into these things. I don't know what that says about society. But, um, no, I know. <laughs> but I was curious to find out, you know, um, people can make up, you know, these, these crimes and um, a lot of fiction books that are related to crime do really well. But as someone who's been in the industry and writing about, you know, true crime stories, does it ever, I guess, how does that play on you emotionally to, to see these things happening to, to real people? Yeah, um, well, it's funny. People always ask me that. And um, I guess it, it reflected in what I enjoy watching in my personal time. So I can't watch, I can't watch horrors, for example, because I know what people genuinely do to each other, the worst things that they'll do. Yeah. So to me, it's not entertainment watching people do these awful things to each other. I do love kind of thrillers, you know, the psychological trying to figure it out, but I'm a puzzle oriented person. Yeah. Um, but really, I like watching kid stuff, cartoons. It's that escapism because I'm embedded all the time in like misery, I guess. And although you're trying to help people, it can get quite heavy, you know, on you all the time, this emotional kind of toll that it can take. Um, so yeah, I love watching cartoons. 
give me a good Disney and that's like a little break. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love Disney too. I think I had kids just to have an excuse to watch Disney. So. <laughs> yeah, I just I just watch with the dogs instead. They don't get as into it as kids would, I think. But you know, that's awesome. Okay, you know, it's great to have that. You know, that outlet. I guess that that chance to to disconnect from it all. Um, but you mentioned before, you know, some people have reached out, giving you some feedback on your books, and and what sort of things do you hear from from readers who do reach out and contact you? Oh, well, a lot of the time people will contact me um, about a case that they want reviewed. Um, mm -hmm. That can be difficult because I get so many of those and you're just kind of one person. Mm -hmm. um, other times, like people will thank me for looking at a case that they may know about or um, be involved in. So recently, um, I was mentioning just before we started recording, um, somebody who's just come across cold case investigations and I mentioned their son's case in that and she wrote to me. And that's where the responsibility comes in of making sure that you're being honest to what you believe to be the truth and being fair. Um, other times people have theories. I get a lot of theories, you know, of what's happened, especially with a big case like the Beaumonts. A lot of people email me after that. Um, even down to people who have like dreams about things and stuff. So it's a whole, a whole mixed bag. Um, sometimes prisoners write to me that claim to have been wrongly convicted. So um, again, yeah, that's, it's really variable who reaches out. Mm. And I think, yeah, how, how do you navigate all of that? Because there would be so many, yeah, like I said, you're just one person, but there would be so many cases, I believe, that would be keeping your interest. So how, how do you yeah. prioritise, if I can use that word? Yeah, it's really difficult because a lot of the time, you know, especially um, if somebody believes somebody's been wrongly convicted, they can be really passionate about it, but they can be no evidence to support that and it's really difficult because um, you can't help everybody and sometimes there's nothing you can do and, and especially when something like a book's come out you get so many of these emails that um, yeah you kind of feel guilty because you can't help everybody um, mm. and you can feel the desperation and they've gone to you know everyone they can think of to try and get somebody to assist them um, so that's that's quite difficult actually to manage um, sometimes I might send them off to one of the innocence initiatives if I think that you know, there's, there's a case there. Um, but other times, yeah, sometimes I just can't help. And that's, that's kind of sad um, because you know that people are really looking for anyone who will listen. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And so coming back to, um, to authorship and your journey to becoming a, an author for the first time and obviously subsequent times after that, um, I do ask all of our guests what, what your Phoenix phenomenon was. So how, how it was that you feel like you have evolved or changed throughout becoming an author. And I know you've already mentioned you, you found your authentic voice and you were able to run with that. But I wanted to see if there was anything else that I guess has helped you um, through the process of becoming an author. I think I've learned how important the narrative is. So in academic writing, you don't think about the narrative of the chapter of what you're writing or the journal article. And yet with writing these books, there's gotta be something at the beginning that hooks people's interest. And it's, although they're real cases, they are stories in that sense. And you've got to have the narrative working, it's got to flow. Um, so that's been an evolution for me, being more brave with my writing and being willing to kind of take on some of those techniques that can hook the audience, because that was really alien to me. When I was writing my PhD, I was not interested in hooking my reader, you know, with each chapter on, you know, stats or whatever it was. It just wasn't even a thought bubble. So I had a great publisher, Pan Mac, um, last time round. She really pushed me out of my comfort zone in terms of seeing these in more of a, a narrative sense. And that's really helped me with my teaching because now I'm really impressed with my students, even if they're writing an essay, there has to be a clear structure that flows, that everything is a story, even if it's factual, it has to give the reader the information they need at the right times in the right way so they can follow the story. So that's something that I've really learned and I'm hoping that I can then help my students learn some of those lessons so that that improves their writing. Absolutely. Dogs are gonna start barking now. That's okay. Um, it would definitely make marking assignments a lot more fun. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, there is that slightly selfish side that it improves their writing, which makes my job easier. <laughs> awesome. 
<laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, I didn't know if you were comfortable with sharing um, any figures on, on how many books you've sold since um, since Mortal Murder. I really don't know, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've never even asked that. I guess because, to me, that's never really been the point. Mm. It's always just been about the discussions. And actually, the most most interesting discussions happen a lot of the time with people you meet or via the media or people who reach out to you so the books are almost like a little incentive to people to have these conversations so mm. i've never even asked is that weird do most authors follow that and, and want to know but it's really great <laughs> i'm gonna have to find out now because i'm like i actually don't have a clue how many i don't know I, I love that because it just means that you're driven by pure passion. So I'm, I'm all for that. That's awesome. Although I'm kind of curious to know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. And so I guess what, what another question I also asked of all of our guests is um, if you have any tips for anyone. Um, now, I know your, your writing is very much um, very heavily researched, um, non-fiction and true crime stories, but... If you were to give any tips for people who are looking at, you know, maybe a, becoming an author has been a dream of theirs, but they haven't quite uh, taken the first steps, what, what would be your advice to them? I guess find something you're passionate about. And because it is a bit like having a baby, you've got to stay the course. You know, it can be hard. And, you know, when you get those edits back, you've got pages and pages of them, or worse for these, the legal report. That's yeah. the one I always fear. Um, so yeah, find something you're passionate about. It really doesn't matter what it is, as long as it really lights your fire, because I think if you're interested and you're passionate, then that will engage the reader. You know, if I didn't write these, I'd be writing about dogs. I think that would be my other thing that I would write about. So yeah, just, and be brave, you know, put yourself out there. It is scary, but then anything worth doing, you know, you have to work, work hard at and take a risk, don't you? So yeah, just, just be bold and give it a go um, and find, find your voice and what you're interested in. Don't try and emulate anybody else. Excellent, I love that. Thank you so much. And how can people get um, their hands on copies of uh, your latest book, Reasonable Doubt, and all of the back catalogue as well? Where, where's the best place for them to go? So they could go to the Pam McMillan website. Um, all good publishers, if they just, Google the title, um, Reasonable Doubt, and my name, it'll pop up. Um, and my other books will come up alongside that as well. So, and I'd love to know what they think. You know, that's, that's why I write these. Not so, I don't like that kind of one way telling people what to think. It's really about the dialogue. That's why I like writing these books. So I'd love to know what people think when they've read it. Excellent. And what's the best way for them to communicate with you? Oh, email, easy. Google my name, I'll pop up at the University of Newcastle. And yeah, they can just drop me an email. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today. It was really great to, to hear what your journey's been like and also for me to ask you some questions about your industry. Because <laughs> you love it, don't you? We love it. It's awesome. In another life, that's probably yeah. what I've done. <laughs> so, and congratulations. So um, do you think it's fair to say there might be some more books in the future? Oh, yeah, I think so. Because there are other things that I've got in my mind that, I guess have evolved my thought process and things that I'd like to write about. Um, so yeah, I think there will be more. I might take a little break because I've done two in the last year and I'm kind of tired. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, there's definitely things that I think conversations that I'd really like to have. Um, yeah, so there'll be another one because I enjoy it. Yeah, I'll say I'll wait a while and then next week I'll be like, yeah, I'm doing another one now. Yeah. I'm ready, let's go. Yeah, let's go, what's next? <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll watch this space and, and I'll keep, uh, keep following you with interest. So thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure to have you on. Thanks very much.